Welcome, all you happy warriors, each and every one of you, thank you for being part of this Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works, and one way the world really works is that uh, happy warriors understand that the more that things change, the more we need to depend on those things that never change, right? That's how it works. The more that things change, the more we need to depend on those things that never change. And one of the things that never changes, (coughs) or I should perhaps say uh, five things that never change, yes, five things that never change, are the five Fs. In other words, whether it was 500 years ago or 50 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 50 years into the future, it makes no difference. People for fulfillment in their lives need that their five Fs are doing well. Your finances, your families, your friendships, your faith, and your fitness. Those are the five things we've always needed. Uh, Human beings, wherever, in any place on earth, and uh, in any time of history, we've all needed to be able to have health, family, friendly relationships, faith, and satisfactory finances. That's always been the case. Now, satisfactory finances, of course, uh, could mean at its most basic level uh, shelter over your head and food to be able to eat every day. Uh, But obviously, it becomes so much more. And that's part of the teaching of the 5F programs. If you haven't yet downloaded your own free copy of The Holistic You um, at my website, rabbidaniellappin.com, then do so now because you will get a better understanding of why it is that even if you are only interested in physical fitness, well, you'll discover that family and finance and uh, and faith and friend, yeah, they all tie in there. If you're only interested in f- finance, well, guess what? You actually need to know something about the other four as well. And so that's one of those aspects of how the world really works, that you have to depend on those things that never change. And these five things never change, that human beings have always needed them and will always need them. There is just no question about that at all. <clears throat> now, uh, part of the reason I can be so certain about all of that is that uh, we human beings are not just minds, we're not just souls, we're also bodies. And uh, our bodies, and you know what I mean by body, right? It's, the, it's those outer casings with which our souls were equipped and which, let's face it, to some extent, shape our destinies. At a young age, I rather sadly came to realize that I was never going to achieve much as a basketball player or as a ballet dancer. Later, I came to terms with the fact that I was never going to be selected as a male fashion model. And what is more, It wasn't because of anti-Semitism. Oh, I would have loved to have been able to blame anti-Semitism. Oh, it's so wonderful to know that you're never at fault for anything that happens in your life. It's always those folks out there that hate you. But unfortunately, my commitment to veracity compelled me to acknowledge that I was never going to be selected as a male model and I was never going to be put on a basketball team, and I was never going to be a ballet dancer, and it wasn't because of anti-Semitism. It was because of my body's biological realities. Now, my body's biological realities, um, you know, gosh, of all my biological realities, none has shaped my life more than my Y chromosomes the fact that I am male. Now, I may not be a candidate for the United States Supreme Court, but I do know 
how I know I am male. I see the evidence every time I take a shower. It's not complicated. It's not that my life's trajectory was entirely controlled by my biology, by my body, uh, by the fact that I am male, but it was obviously shaped and influenced by my biology. Uh, It was absolutely clear that the fact that I was male precluded some things and required other things. And the fact that I was not super tall or super talented at basketball, that closed off that particular avenue. Now, look, uh, one has the body that one has, including how many chromosomes, whether they're XX or XY, in other words, whether you're male or female, and uh, and your life continues along that trajectory. Now, you can rage about it in furious anger. You can shake a defiant fist at destiny for making you that. Or one can indulge in fantasies about changing one's sex. I get it. It's really annoying to think that I am not fully in charge of my own life, and that in reality, not all choices lie open before me. And I get it, that when enough people in a community, or in a society, or in a country, all start feeling those repeated little rebellious brain bolts, insisting, I am in charge of my own life, and I can do whatever I like, then it uh, creates a sort of spiritual virus that spreads through the community and through the society and through the country. And eventually, many people who may not even know what their own motivations really are start to feel urgent mental pressures to change their bodies and to change their biology. It's perfectly natural and perfectly normal. I totally get it. The most reliable way of dealing with it I mean really dealing with it, not merely ignoring it, is to acknowledge that I am not all-powerful, that there is, in fact, a greater force who decided that I was to be born male, and that the person who did me the supreme honor of agreeing to be my wife was to be born female. Then, of course, we met But no, that's an entirely different story for another time. So every morning, both my wife and I, along with vast numbers of other Hebrews who pray each day according to the standard Jewish prayer book, we say a short 10-word blessing, thanking God for making me the way he chose to make me. That's it. End of story. Now, I used to say that little blessing every day as a boy, even though it was long before I knew or even believed that it was true. But that daily start to the morning that emphasized that it wasn't sheer fate, it wasn't blind luck that made me a male not tall enough to play basketball and not talented enough to dance ballet, that statement, whether I believed it or not, because when I was, you know, when I was young, I I was uh, a boy, what did I know? And I, you know, I said it because that was what I was taught I was supposed to do. But I didn't really think about whether, was it true? Did I believe it? Was there really a God who created me in exactly the way he chose? But the very fact that I said it and my own ears heard my own mouth articulate that every day, well, that did a lot to quell much teenage anxiety, and it helped form a personality comfortable with the idea that not everything falls under my control, and neither am I personally responsible for absolutely everything. There are certain things God did. God made me a male. I didn't choose to be a male. That's it. This is one of the ways in which the F of faith is so helpful. He made you male, Lappin. Live with it, accept it, and just get on with life. Now, when you have a child, it's a great gift because it forces you to have to confront certain things that as a child yourself, you can pretty much safely ignore. 
And then you have a child, and now all of a sudden, you got to decide whether to live your life and help your child to live its early life in accordance with one of two possible alternative life schematics. You've got to be able to say to your child, one way or the other, because not making a decision on this is making a default decision. You've basically got to decide that you have to tell your child how human beings arrived on this planet. Right? I mean, one of the earliest one of the earliest questions that little children ask is, you know, where did I come from or how am I here? Or, um, I remember, you know, when, when I travel on a plane, how often it would happen if I was sitting next to a, a child and we got chatting and it was always fun to talk to the kids, you know, of a certain age. One of the very first questions is, you know, where are you from? And it's, it's a basic question. So uh, even if your child doesn't deliberately and uh, and uh, and and particularly articulate where am i from or how did we get here that's a question that's on their mind and you can test this you can just ask your your child um you know do you uh, uh, do you think there were people there were always people on on this planet on earth are there people on other planets do we know about that and if you know why why are they in one place and not another or maybe they're everywhere how did they get to be there these are questions your child will find interesting to talk about and so you you end up having to decide that you have to say look either we live our life according to a spiritual schematic which says that uh, the good Lord God created us, and he placed us here, and um, and he gave us certain um, um, manuals of instruction. And the other way is either ignoring, in which case your local geek, namely the government indoctrination camp that used to be called a public school, to which you send your child, will tell your child that uh, we are here because of a lengthy process of unaided, completely materialistic evolution, and that the only difference between you and a gorilla is one of where exactly you fit on the evolutionary timeline. Now, there, there really are significant consequences to how you decide to raise your family. Uh, one of them, just for instance, um, is the uh, story that I tell in one of my books um, about a, a rabbi teacher of mine many years ago who was traveling on an El Al Israel Airlines flight, and he found himself sitting next to uh, the second in command of Israel's largest socialist party. And uh, they started talking, and what happened was that the um, uh, soon after the, the plane got boarded and everyone was sitting down, a, a young man came from the rear of the plane and uh, brought some slippers, and he took off the rabbi's shoes and he put on slippers. And the, nab the rabbi's neighbor, with whom they'd already, he'd already started a conversation, and raised his eyebrows, and he said, oh, um, you know, my feet swell at 30,000 feet, and uh, and so it's a long flight, and so I like changing to slippers. Uh, and then before we land, he'll bring back my shoes. And um, the, uh, uh, the 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 head, the head the deputy head of the Labour Party uh, nodded, and he was he was obviously very interested. Then after takeoff, uh, this young man came and and gave a uh, package of sandwiches to the rabbi. The rabbi opened them offered his uh, friend one, and again the friend said, what's that? He said, well, I don't like the airline food so much, and my wife always sends uh, um, food. And he says, well, I just want to tell you something. My sons have never taken such nice care of me as your sons do. And the rabbi often says, no, no, that's a disciple of mine. It's a student. If my sons were here, they'd really be looking after me. And the uh, deputy head of the Israel Socialist Party started weeping. Tears came to his eyes, and the rabbi said, what's the matter? And he said to him, I just, I don't understand why my children have never related to me the way your 
students, let alone your children, are relate to you. And the rabbi said, don't weep. Uh, your children have been completely faithful to your teachings, and mine have been completely faithful to mine. The, uh, the friend said, what do you mean? He said, look, didn't you teach your children that we are descended from gorillas? And the, um, the labor movement guy said, well, yeah, because I believe that to be the case. He said, fine. Well, your children realize that they are one generation further removed from gorillas. That means they are one generation more sophisticated and more evolved and more advanced. And so it's only right that you should serve them because you are closer to gorillas than they are. And so they've been absolutely faithful to your teachings. My children um, believe, as I do, that we were touched by the finger of God and as a result, each passing generation is one generation further away from that glorious divine origin. And so it's only right that I am closer and therefore they should serve me. And so painted in a number of different colors, that is what plays out in everybody's family in one way or another. Uh, the relationship between parents and children is just one example of something that is so contingent on this fundamental question, how you settle this question, that um, uh, are we here because of uh, a lengthy process of completely materialistic evolution, or are we here because a loving God created us in his image and put us here? And the, the implications are very real and very serious. And by the time you realize it, as did this uh, Israeli Labour Party leader, uh, it's too late to do anything about it because that spiritual schematic gets imprinted on your soul very early. And it's like that with many other spiritual schematics as well. And so if you want to be a happy warrior, and uh, part of that means building a family, improving your family, working on your family, advancing your family, uh, then that's one of the things you want to think of. And that's part of what being a happy warrior means. Talking of which, by the way, we've got a brand new happy warrior merchandise store. This is really cool. A number of people have been asking me. Uh, it started off, you know, I like saying all the time that um, uh, happy warriors are not tennis balls floating down the gutter of life. And uh, what I mean by that, of course, is that uh, uh, we, we take charge. We take charge of our lives. And uh, we, we do not blame anything that happens uh, because of outside circumstances. We recognize our own agency. We recognize our own responsibility. And so people ask me if uh, we... You know, if they can make a T-shirt with the words that um, we are not tennis balls floating down the gutter of life. And, uh, you know, I, I said, well, you know what, we'll, we'll do better than that. Uh, we will make an authorized one. And so, sure enough, it's, it's a great T-shirt. I, I love wearing it. And, um, and I also, while I was at it, uh, a lot of people have asked me about my, my tie, you know, and... Uh, because, you know, my tie is usually a yellow tie. So uh, we decided, fine, no problem. We created uh, a Happy Warriors yellow tie. <laughs> and so, again, uh, I, I like it very much indeed. And uh, I am looking forward to starting to spot people, um, you know, in, uh, in, in airports and at churches and at events, uh, wearing either a Happy Warriors t-shirt or a Happy Warriors tie or uh, any of the other things. And by the way, here's the nice thing. Uh, this, this merchandise store ships internationally. So uh, you must take a look at it. We got caps. Oh, here's something really cute. And again, this was this was not my idea, but, uh, but I loved it. And that is um, a little... Um, a little bodysuit for a for a little baby that's labeled future happy warrior uh, also a bib for eating Fu these are such cute things i got to tell you they really are and they're in traditional blue pink colors if you don't mind um there is also um susan and our daughters have special 
uh, aprons when they start uh, preparing special food for the family, particularly on the Sabbath, for the for the Sabbath, they put on a special apron, and so uh, Susan always has her challah baking apron. And so a, a number of people who watched the video of Susan preparing special special uh, Sabbath bread called challah uh, noticed she was wearing this apron. They asked about it, and so sure enough, we got one of those as well, and. Uh, Anyway, you've got to take a look at this. You just go to our website, rabbidaniellappin.com, rabbidaniellappin.com, and uh, go to the store, and then look for the merchandise section of the store. And uh, it's great. And uh, did I tell you that uh, we ship internationally as well? That's so cool. Anyway, um, I think you'll... I mean, I, I just got such a kick out of this stuff, and, uh, and I hope that you do as well. So... Uh, um, so there it is. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that certain, I call them spiritual schematics, get imprinted on your soul um, d- at different st- stages of your life. And look, they are not easy to change. But as happy warriors, we have to learn to change them. We absolutely do not surrender to wrong spiritual schematics. And we do not allow our spiritual schematic to define our life or to shape our life or to be blamed for our life. But you've got to recognize it. It is there. And um, so you've got to know that on, on this question of how human beings arrived on the planet, right, it's very, very real. It's a question you'll be shocked at what young ages your children will be interested in having that conversation with you. And if you decide not to decide, you follow what I mean? If you decide, you know what, you just don't want to deal with this, you don't want to have this conversation with your kids, or you just ignore it, and, uh, and you decide, look, you know, we're not discussing anything about how, how we arrived on planet Earth. Deciding to not discuss it is actually making a default dis- decision, in that you have made the decision to surrender the power of shaping your child's worldview to the culture around you and to the school your child goes to. And this is what you got to know. If you do that, you cannot have any later recriminations because the common culture has a lot of views on many things, not all of which you'll like, but the most important and fundamental and the very first one you have the opportunity to form is how we got to planet Earth. If you yield to the common culture on that, then you have also yielded on a whole slew of questions that follow in its wake. It might be 25 years or so before your child will be open to the alternative view again. Can I give you an example? Look, happy warriors, let's say, let's say that one day you feel that taxes are far higher than they should be. And you might turn to your teenage child for moral support and sympathy. But this is the child who 12 years ago, you either taught that we are the natural and inevitable result of gorillas mutating randomly, or perhaps you shirked your parental duty and allowed the common culture to inculcate that in your child. Either way, you are now in the situation of a teenage child whose spiritual schematic is that we are the result of natural random evolution. Well, then that also means that we are nothing but basically the equivalent of animals in a zoo or in a farmer's barnyard. And if that's true, then redistribution of wealth makes perfect sense. That's right. Because if you're a farmer and you see um, after you put out the uh, feed for your cows, you discover one cow's gathered up all the feed and sort of got it in a pile at its feet and is zealously guarding it. and None of the other uh, cows have any feed. You go out and you'll redistribute the assets, obviously. Or if you're a zookeeper, and you see that uh, 
you know, one of the big elephants has taken all the food you put out for all the different elements, and this elephant is keeping, you'll go and redistribute it. Because with animals, handing out what each animal needs, to paraphrase Marxist's term, you know, to each according to his need, it's quite easy to figure out an animal's need. Right? I'm not a biologist, but I, I know how to access the information. And if you tell me the age and the size and the weight of an elephant, I'll tell you how much food it needs every day. You tell me uh, a, a cow, I'll tell you exactly how much food it needs every day. How about if there's another cow with a different approach? <laughs> there's no such thing. With animals, there's a very important point. These animals, you can all, with every animal, you can predict the need. Well, obviously, since socialism and progressivism and leftist extremism and Marxism, all they all take the approach that we are nothing but animals evolved, well, then you mustn't be surprised that they also believe that it is possible for government to give to each of us according to our need. And then I say, well, wait a moment, government. Um, I don't need so much money um, for my child's education, because I want to educate my child myself, but I do need more money for food because I enjoy eating French cuisine. The government says, what are you talking about? We'll tell you what you need, just the way a farmer would say to its cows or a zookeeper would say to his elephant. No, stop being foolish. I'll tell you what you need. But if you know that human beings are quite different from animals then nobody else can determine my needs. Nobody else should determine my needs. It's a chutzpah. It's impudent. It's insolent. You, you have no right to determine what I need because I am a human being and I'm created in the image of God and I'm unique unlike any other human being. And my disease, desires and my needs are probably also unique. And so by giving your child or allowing your child to willy-nilly just pick up an incorrect view of reality, namely that people and animals are basically the same thing, you have condemned your child to inevitable subsequent ideas and views that are not an accurate reflection of how the world really works. You've got to know that. It all flows from these early conversations. And so you've got to be aware of what I speak of as a spiritual schematic that is being imprinted on your child because it's going to impact the future life of your child. It'll impact the entire family's cooperation and structure. So in many important ways, peripheral worldviews we acquire actually do shape our destinies. Our spiritual schematics do sculpt our lives as much or more than biology does. So yes, my biology decreed that uh, I can be a father, not a mother. My biology decreed that uh, I am going to uh, be more aggressive than passive. Um, my biology decreed that I'm not good enough to uh, be able to dance. I'm not talented, and I don't have the body of a dancer, and I don't have the body of a football player. These are just not areas that I'm really well equipped for. Right? It doesn't mean I have no choices in life. It means the choices are confined by reality. My choices are somewhat shaped by the choices God made in the first place. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Um, but as much or as little as biology shapes my life, the spiritual schematics imprinted on me did much more to shape my life. For instance, should you grow up wrapped around the basic idea that humans are exactly the same as every other animal on the planet? It's just that humans are at a different point along the evolutionary timetable then many outcomes follow almost inevitably. For example, if you believe that humans are just another form of animal along the evolutionary timeline, you will end up being far more susceptible than I am to authority, like government, 
much more than someone whose worldview is rooted in human beings being unique creatures touched by the finger of God. We all like to think of ourselves as independent-minded, sentient beings, carefully and rationally making all decisions, right? We like to believe that. But what I want you to consider is the possibility that what I'm telling you is true and that you are more shaped than you realize by the spiritual schematic that was imprinted on you years ago. The reality is that in many aspects of our lives, we proceed on kind of autopilot. Uh, We brush our teeth on autopilot, which is why occasionally sometimes we can't recall, uh, you know, did I brush my teeth today or not? Well, you didn't actually remember doing it because your mind was off elsewhere and you were doing the toothbrushing on autopilot. And um, similarly, Uh, we arrive at certain conclusions. We think certain things without really thinking them through. Sometimes people who've spent their formative childhood years in a broken and dysfunctional family, such people often grow up implacably opposed to marriage and determined not to ever marry. Uh, When I used to do a terrestrial radio show on KSFO in San Francisco, Uh, From time to time, I would do a show on marriage and family, and I would have callers, sometimes man, sometimes woman, would call up and explain that they never, ever want to have children. They don't think it's right to bring children into this bad, bad world, and they don't want to get married. If it's a man, it's because uh, uh, women take you for everything you've got. If it's a woman, it's that uh, marriage is just institutionalized slavery and I just have to end up not living my life of fulfillment but just serving other people in my family, whatever it is. Um, I always got them a, uh, try to get them a little bit disarmed and calmed down and then I'd say, by the way, tell me a little about your background. Tell me about your childhood, how you grew up, how you grew up. And I've got to tell you, pretty much without exception, Every time somebody launched into a a view of hostility to family, hostility to marriage, hostility to having children, they grew up in horrible childhood circumstances. Uh, Broken family, dysfunctional family, parents divorced early, sequence of boyfriends or girlfriends with, with, with whichever parent they were stuck with, and nothing but nightmarish horror stories about their childhood. And the funny thing is that they never linked that to their own attitude towards marriage and children. They always came up with another rationale. Well, it's because there's such a bad world, or it's because a child will is bad for the environment, or but it's never, you know what, my own horrible childhood imprinted a spiritual schematic on me that turned me against a family structure because we don't always realize how it happens. It is subconscious. And uh, if you think about that concept, you'll see it play out quite often, either in your own life or in the lives of those with whom you live or with whom you work or with whom you socialize. And you'll see that many of the opinions that people have are rooted in something that happened to them earlier a spiritual schematic that was imprinted on their souls, although very often they'll tell you a reason for why they have the opinion they have, and they don't even realize that they've come up with the opinion to justify the position. They've they've come up with, they've rationalized an explanation to justify the position they're already taking. It's not that they took the position because of the explanation, The explanation is to justify the position that they are taking because of an underlying spiritual schematic. I hope that that is reasonably clear. But, uh, you know, happy warriors, above all, know themselves. And what I'm teaching you now is aspects of how to know yourself. And as always, I say, listen, you know, some of this is so hard to hear that all I ask is you don't reject it because it's mindless and childish to reject something that you don't like. Uh, you have to contemplate it. You've got to think about it. 
And if after having thought about it and measured it and judged it with your experiences and your reality, and then you say, ah, no, you're not, he's wrong, this doesn't make any sense, well, then fine, you can do that because that's an adult process. But uh, what happens on university campuses today around the world is that uh, students reject with anger any view with which they don't agree. Okay, so we mustn't make that mistake because happy warriors can hear ideas that make them uncomfortable. All right? So um, so we've we got to understand that, yes, <clears throat> very often people who spent formative childhood years in a broken and dysfunctional family, well, yeah, they grow up implacably opposed to marriage and determined not to ever marry. It's perfectly natural and perfectly normal, but it is tragic all the same. Often they can't really explain why, and when asked, they quote their oft-repeated but false divorce statistics. You know why I don't want to get married? Well, because 50% of marriages end in divorce. Well, that's not true, but I understand that you're not getting married, you don't want to get married because of the horrible childhood home in which you grew up. I get that. I also get that you don't want to say to yourself, it's too painful. You never want to say to yourself, you know what, I had horrible parents who didn't even care about me. They just cared about themselves and they destroyed their lives and they made my life hard. You don't want to say that. And that's why I don't want to get married. No, I don't want to get married because it hurts the environment. I don't want to get married because marriages end in divorce. Because sometimes we say and do things and think things for reasons that we do not always understand. So often we act in certain ways for reasons that are hardwired into our soul, but we don't fully understand that. And so we come up with explanations that are not even true, that we think explains why we did the things we did. Certain things do get hardwired into our souls. Doesn't mean you can't get them out. You can. It just takes work. Now, I told you all of that, even though I think many happy warriors already know this, But I told you because I want you to open your hearts to one very special, deeper understanding of this with critical implications to your life. In the same way that you were imbued with a spiritual schematic that leads you to a fierce independence of government and a visceral hatred for government handouts, whether they go to people who've never held a job in their lives or whether they go to windmill manufacturers or solar panel manufacturers, um, you are probably somebody who doesn't care for your tax money to be used for those purposes. Or alternatively, maybe your spiritual schematic leads you to an unquestioning comfort with being dependent upon other people and being dependent on government. In the same way that you are imbued with a spiritual schematic that makes you feel warm and positive about marriage and family, or alternatively, the spiritual schematic with which you are imbued leads you to in the reverse direction. And these spiritual schematics are not your destiny. They lead you in a specific direction and cause you to intuitively think certain things. But you always do have the power to defy them and to carve your own path. In the same way you were imbued from somewhere with a spiritual schematic that constantly assures you that you live in a world of great abundance or alternatively, Maybe your spiritual schematic always warns you that we live in a world of shortage. Don't underestimate the importance of repairing your spiritual schematic. Many people have seen movies and TV shows in which the evil, murderous villain is a maniacal millionaire. And so over the years, entertainment shows Popular entertainment makes the majority of murderers rich business professionals, males, in spite of the fact that this bears almost no resemblance 
to the reality of crime in the United States of America. It nonetheless has an impact. It helps to shape your spiritual schematic. Oh, rich people are criminals. Um, You've often heard politicians say, well, the rich must pay their fair share. That makes you feel that maybe the rich people are cheaters and they don't pay their fair share. And you don't even stop to ask yourself, who are the rich? Or what is the definition of fair share? But it, it works to influence your thinking. You may have heard statements such as, you know, rich people can't get to heaven. Well, that reinforces your, your spiritual schematic that rich is bad. Uh, you may have heard that when people give charity, it's called giving back to society. And your spiritual schematic says, well, if giving charity is giving back to society, then I guess making money in the first place is ripping off from society. All of these things from the culture, little by little, you know, little brain bolt after little brain bolt, time after time, little by little, they impact you and they sculpt the outline of your spiritual schematic. And if having money is proof of bad behavior, then it's better to stay poor and know at least that you're a good, decent human being, right? What a great justification for poverty and financial stress. At least I'm a good person. That's why I don't have money. I'm such a good, decent person. That's what it's done to you. And so instead of feeling happy and fulfilled and moral and uplifted and dignified in your process of making money, you accept financial stress, you accept poverty, and you say, well, this is just because I'm such a good person. I don't want to be an evil person. I don't want to be rich if it means having to sell your soul. See, so many people hold themselves back from financial success for fear that monetary achievement shows that they are not good people. So I want you to see how failing to repair a bad spiritual schematic is going to leave you dangerously susceptible to it. Well, your spiritual schematic on whether we live in a world of shortage or abundance is all part of it. You know, I teach uh, all the time for people to carry, you know, 15 or 20 three by five index cards held together with a rubber band in your pocket. And this then becomes a wonderful capture device. You've got to put down the name of somebody you met. You've got to put down a phone number. You've got to put down a, a business idea you just had. Uh, whatever you don't have time to go to your computer or to your main and then at the end of every day you spend a few minutes at your desk and you process each of the three by five index cards of the day and there'll be things that that you would otherwise forget that can be very useful so that's what I teach but one point I emphasize is and I say this several times during my presentation I say you must put one idea or thought or action on each card not two or three or five or ten only one per card and then I sometimes come back and I talk to the same group a year later six months later whatever it is and I ask people to show me you know and about half the people have implemented it and pull out their three by five index cards and then I say show me ones that you've used today And I always find in every group there are a few people who cannot handle the directive of putting only one idea or one piece of information on each card. And they've got their cards are filled up. They're like little scribble pads. Their card has a telephone number on one corner, a a reminder in another corner. What's that all about? Shall I tell you? It's people whose spiritual schematic is one of shortage. For heaven's sake, right? Anybody can afford an index card, and yet they can't bear the thought of just putting one. There's all that blank space on the card. That's one instance of where I see people. And I explain to them, you are suffering from a shortage schematic. That you, your soul has subscribed to the doctrine of, of shortage. And it's hurting you far more seriously than just in your three by five three by five capture uh, idea capture device much more it's hurting you in other areas of your life you've 
got to fix the spiritual schematic that says you live in a world of shortage and uh, you must examine yourself to see if you have bought into that why would you buy into it because it's the message of the culture everything you hear from the culture addresses the idea of shortage you got to know that if your spiritual schematic is shortage doctrine you will handicap your efforts subconsciously you won't be able to help yourself Look, if there isn't enough to go around of anything because there's a shortage, then what sort of horrible human being would you be to want and perhaps have more than other people? In a world of shortage, equal distribution of resources and assets is the only way to go. So you can see why all left-leaning, progressive, and socialistic power structures push the shortage doctrine. After all, without without the, the refereeing effect of government, without government to level out the playing field, perhaps some will get more than their fair share, showing that they are greedy, reprehensible robber barons. What are other symptoms of shortage thinking? Well, you may not like this one because you may have been so indoctrinated to do it, that you don't realize that you are doing it not because of the reason you tell yourself, which is it's environmentally responsible and it doesn't do any harm anyway, so why not do it? No, you're doing it because you have been conditioned to believe in your heart of hearts in the shortage doctrine. Your spiritual schematic embodies a world of shortage. So think about it, recycling. Look, Bear with me for just a moment here. Just open open your hearts to this, even if you are a dedicated recycler, because, and it does make you feel good. After all, in a world of shortage, you can't just throw stuff away. If there really was a shortage, then you would be able to make money by selling your bottles and plastics and aluminum beer cans. But it isn't, you see. In their desperation to push the doctrine of shortage... States like Hawaii and California and some others created an artificial market in recyclables called in California the CRV, the California Redemptive Value. What happens is bottlers and manufacturers and retailers and stores have to charge customers a fee, basically a tax, an extra five cents, sometimes more, and the consumers pay this on every can of beer or bottle of mayonnaise. And then this goes to the government. And then technically, if you bring the container back to the store, they give you back the five cents. Needless to say, the majority of people don't do that because they don't deep down feel there's a shortage. And there's certainly not a shortage in their lives for five cents, so they toss them away. So, for instance, California right now is sitting on nearly a billion dollars of unclaimed deposits. And guess who gets to use that? It was a wonderful way to add to the ability of politicians to spend other people's money. And it wasn't even called a tax. And it was passed in the name of virtue, in the name of helping to solve the shortage. After all, You know, we're short of plastic because plastic comes from oil and we're short of oil and we're short of of aluminum. The point, however, is, and I, I really want you to think about this, the point, however, is that if there really was a shortage of aluminum or of plastic or of glass, the government would not have to create this artificial incentive system to make people bring their containers back to the store. The economy would do it automatically. It would self-adjust and did until people did sell their used glass and plastic and paper, etc., and there would eventually be economically viable ways to reuse those materials, which they are not at the moment. It's all the result, not of real shortage, but it's created artificially short, an artificially created shortage to pay homage at the religious altar of shortage doctrine. That's really what it is. And it's, it's something that uh, 
gosh, we, we, we need to grasp, we really need to fully understand, I think. You know, just the other day, and I was looking at a singles website um, where singles, it, it's, it's for marriage purposes, it's uh, um, single men and women post their profiles, and almost to a woman, uh, this did happen to be a Jewish website, I guess I should mention. But almost to a woman, all the single women on that website declared themselves to be left-wing liberal. You know, there's a place where you can put in your political position. Now, why on earth, I ask myself, would they, why would these women who are really looking for husbands, why would they discourage the entire large group of intelligent, handsome, and virile Jewish conservative bachelors. Like, why? And um, a single Jewish businesswoman who uh, I know recently helped me understand the answer. I was talking to her about it, and she said she welcomes higher electricity prices. Why? And she said, well, because they incentivize her to cut down her power usage. Got that? Using lots of electricity is a problem, not because it's expensive, but because it's evil. She wanted electricity to cost more in order to reduce energy usage. Do you hear what I'm telling you about here? Happy warriors, do you hear? This is incredibly bizarre. Now, the trouble, the reason it doesn't sound enough bizarre is because you're so used to it. But think about it in standalone objective terms. This is mad. This wasn't about saving money. This girl owns her own condo and she wears $400 suits. She was talking morality, doing the right thing, not the economical thing. In an energy shortage, it is wrong to use more than your fair share. Well, do we really have an energy, a shortage of energy? Should we be rationed? Well, the moral answer is yes, if we are suffering an energy shortage and no, if we are only imagining one. And this is not the first time that we've imagined an energy shortage. Until the early 18th century in America, in North America, colonial homes were heated mostly by burning wood. Forests were vanishing, and the rapidly growing colonies were running out of firewood. They really were. Um, at the, if you read the documentation of the day, the call was eliminate immigration. We can't have any more people because we have no more wood to burn. And we have to ration firewood. No matter how much money you got, you may not buy more than your fair share of firewood. And then all of a sudden they found coal and they began burning coal. All of a sudden nobody worried anymore about wood shortages because there seemed to be plenty coal. Uh, well, um, by 1840, America was getting its energy from about a million tons of coal a year. That's 1840. The country began in 1776. So less than 100 years, we're burning a million tons of coal a year. Over in the United Kingdom, an economics professor at University College in London called William Jevons uh, became famous on an account of a paper he published in 1865. Uh, the paper was called The Coal Question, an inquiry concerning the progress of the nation and the probable exhaustion of our coal mines. He predicted that British prosperity would end within 50 years, right? That's by 19, uh, 1915, when the nation ran out of coal and recommended an industrial slowdown in order to conserve what coal was left, rationing coal. We're just about into uh, where, well, let me just say we're in the 21st century. I'm recording this in 2022, and Great Britain is still mining coal and still burning coal with no end in sight. He was wrong. We don't live in a world of shortage. America used to depend on whale oil for lighting. During the early 19th century, Pundits used to warn that since whales were being harvested at never-increasing rate, America would soon go dark. And, and, you know, I mean, there are entire towns in Massachusetts that were built on the wealth of the whale oil industry. 
So again, they recommend turning out all lights no later than 10 o'clock at night in order to conserve what whale oil was left. Now look, they were right about running out of whale oil. There's no question about it. They were killing whales at a faster rate than whales could reproduce. But they were wrong about America going dark. Because in 1859, a railway conductor called Edwin Drake found oil on his land in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Lanterns throughout America started burning paraffin instead of whale oil. And that continued until Edison's electricity lit American cities. Since the 1970s, we've heard so much about exhausting the world's petroleum reserves. Right. It's no qu- they argue about how long it'll be before we run out of oil, but everyone's sure we'll run out of oil. And uh, the question is, surely we should advise oil conservation as they once did with firewood and whale oil and coal. Yeah, we've got to not use so much oil. We've got to impose CAFE restrictions on cars, totally unrealistic restrictions that destroy the car industry. Uh, to make cars basically run on fresh air. The truth is that although we do need energy, we have no need specifically for firewood or whale oil, whale oil or coal or even petroleum. Each in its age suited our purpose. The fact is that we have a central understanding that Human beings, unlike animals, human beings must use energy. Animals seek no external source of energy. They hunt and gather, always expending less bodily energy in the quest than they gain from consuming the quarry. But we humans yearn to liberate ourselves from drudgery in order to devote ourselves to higher purpose. Whatever you think your higher purpose is, but deep down we all feel that we do not want to spend a day walking to the office or walking to work. We want to use our free time for... Now, tragically, we have become a nation that uses our free time for entertainment and amusement and pleasure. But you get the idea. It was our limitless human ingenuity that carried us from firewood to coal and from whale oil to petroleum. We are capable of infinite creativity and invention, and we don't have to contemplate energy shortage. Maybe nuclear power is for us today what petroleum was to those who foresaw the end of of whale oil, right? Who knows? But one thing is for sure, and that is that shortage is an untrue doctrine. Nobody yet really knows for sure, but there are very solid grounds to believe that underground or undersea oil is not the result of fossilized decomposition of plants and animals from long ago. That's called the biotic genesis theory of oil. Um, Instead, it's very likely, very probable in my view, that oil is continually being created by a chemical reaction taking place under intense heat and intense pressure deep underground. And that's called the uh, abiotic genesis of oil. And um, it's, it's, uh, this, this abiotic oil is really worth looking at. Now, what I've got to tell you is that since the culture is so dedicated to the doctrine of shortage that you probably have never ever this you probably have never heard what i'm about to tell you you probably have heard again and again and again since you've been a little child that uh, all the dead dinosaurs decomposed and became oil and decaying plant matter over millions of years all the trees and vegetables died and decayed and they turned into oil uh, and they turned into coal why did they never turn into coal and oil in the same place? Nobody actually knows the answer to that question. In other words, why don't we find coal seams in the same vicinity as we find oil deposits? We should if it's decaying, old decaying trees. Nobody knows the answer to that. And I think the answer may be that a lot of oil, maybe all of it, I don't know, is created abiotically. 
so um, we 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 we've got to be open to this. It's a weird idea, um, and and you've got to know that there's a lot of people. There are a lot of serious scientists who are into the abiotic theory of oil. This is not a crackpot idea. Even if Wikipedia says mostly discredited, it isn't. It's not at all the case. So don't think that you can dismiss abiotic physicists and geologists as heretics or frauds. Um, They hold that oil can be derived from hydrocarbons that existed eons ago in massive pools deep within the Earth's core. And that source of hydrocarbon seeps up through the Earth's layers and slowly replenishes oil sources. In other words, it turns the fossil fuel paradigm upside down. You know I've never been happy with the fossil fuel term for coal and oil and gas. I call them God-given fuels. But uh, it may be even more true than I ever thought, in that it has absolutely nothing to do with fossils. Um, For instance, uh, off the coast of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico, there was an oil field that was supposed to have been emptied years ago. They predicted how long and how much reserves they were, and uh, and for a while it behaved like any normal oil field. Uh, They opened it in 1973. It's called Eugene Island. Um, and it peaked at about 15,000 barrels of oil a day. By 89, 16 years later, production had slowed to about 4,000 barrels a day, which is exactly what they anticipated. Then suddenly, and inexplicably, Eugene Island started producing more oil, and now it's up to 13,000 barrels a day, and uh, probable reserves have rocketed to more than 400 million barrels but they used to measure only 60 million. So where did the extra 400 million barrels come from? Did they make a mistake measuring? Well, no, because the scientists studying the uh, Eugene Island field say that the crude oil coming out of the pipes now is of a geological age quite different from the oil that gushed out when they opened the field in the first place. Um, At Cornell University, uh, there's a uh, professor called Thomas Gold. And he, he says, look, it's clear that oil is a renewable resource constantly manufactured in the earth under ultra-hot conditions and tremendous pressures. And this stuff migrates towards the surface. It's attacked by bacteria, which can sometimes make it appear as if it has an organic origin, dating back to the dinosaurs. And uh, look, I'm I'm not telling you this is a fact. I'm not a geologist. I don't know. But I do know that much information is suppressed today by the world of science because it does not fit the political preferences of the ruling class in the United States of America. I do believe that scientific information and medical information on ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine uh, during the COVID epidemic were suppressed. Uh, I believe a lot of information that doesn't fit the left-wing narrative gets suppressed. And this would be one of them because, well, wait a sec, why why on earth would anybody, including the socialist world of progressive thinking, why would they want to um, uh, have you believe a world of shortage? Well, because in a world of shortage, redistribution makes all the sense in the world. It makes sense. And since they want to push for redistribution, they need that. Also, if there is shortage, then you need government and larger government, ever larger government, in order to uh, help us level the playing field. Because how are we going to distribute a, a, a very rare resource fairly, right? If there's unlimited quality quantities of something, we don't need any government to establish fair distribution, we can just let the marketplace do that. It's very important. So uh, many scientists now uh, believe that Eugene Island is refilling itself from far down beneath the Earth's surface. And, uh, And that indicates that oil may not be the limited resource it is assumed to be. And I'm 
I got hold of a Forbes magazine article. I keep a lot of old articles, and uh, I really must digitize them because at the moment that I've got them taking up literally shelf after shelf after shelf of uh, space. These are old articles I clipped. Forbes magazine back in 2008 was reporting how a group of Russian scientists and Ukrainian ones, by the way, uh, say that oil and gas do not come from fossils. They're synthesized deep within the Earth's mantle by heat pressure and other purely chemical means before rising to the surface. Um, it's interesting. They say the idea that oil comes from fossils is a myth that needs changing. And uh, that's a petroleum engineer by the name of Vladimir Kucherov speaking at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. All kinds of rocks and oil all kind of rocks could have oil and gas deposits. So um, this is, uh, is, is something I think we should all be aware of and fully understand that, uh, no, we do not live in a world of shortage, not of oil, not of plastic, not of aluminum, not of glass, and uh, we don't live in a, shortage, a world of shortage of money either. But that, my friends is really another discussion altogether. But for today, I want you to remember and to wrap yourself around this idea, contemplate it, chew on it, mull on it, that if you accept the indoctrination of shortage, then that forms your spiritual schematic and that holds you back from maximum financial potential. Because deep inside you, on a subconscious level, you believe that since there's a shortage of everything, including money, it's not right for you to have more than other people around you. And in a certain way, you fear success. And you handicap your own progress in very damaging and destructive ways. And I, I so hope that you can think a lot about this idea of how your spiritual schematic could be hurting you in many different ways. And then you will begin to work on, on changing that schematic. How to do that? Well, that's something you can think about. You can write to me. And uh, after I've given you a chance to work on it a little bit and chew on it, I will then give you some additional thoughts beyond what you came up with on how it is that we can change our spiritual schematic and how wonderful it is and what it contributes to your success when you do so. Our website, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, as you will probably remember, check in and take a look <clears throat> at the um, at the store, have a look at the merchandise store. There's such cute things there. Uh, they're absolutely terrific. You'll uh, perhaps need something for a gift for somebody. You got it right there. And um, also, I want you to take a look at uh, the online course, Scrolling Through Scripture. Please take a look at that at rabbidaniellappin.com. Online course, Scrolling Through Scripture. And the reason is because... As I say, there are two different spiritual schematics on this topic. One spiritual schematic says we live in a world of shortage. And believe me when I tell you that this spiritual schematic hurts your progress, handicaps your growth. And then there's another spiritual schematic that says how wonderful to live in a world of such abundance. And it so happens that the schematic, the spiritual schematic of abundance happens to correspond to people who have faith. And the spiritual schematic of uh, shortage is one that is found mostly among people who are secular fundamentalists. And so here's what I am recommending. I'm not saying you've got to become a person of faith. and you've got, I'm not talking about major spiritual changes. But I am suggesting that you take a look at the book that has structured and shaped Western civilization, the book from which the very idea comes that it is right for human beings to use external sources of energy like firewood and coal and oil and nuclear power, 
And to do that, you uh, you really, I mean, you can, you can get a really good handle on it. Whether you are a person of faith or not, it doesn't matter. We're not going with labels here. Anybody can take a serious look at Scripture through ancient Jewish wisdom. And perhaps nowhere more important is it than in studying the first 31 verses of Genesis. That's it. When you've mastered that, you've already got a handle on the faith angle of uh, the happy warrior. And so that's what I cover in 20 manageable lessons in scrolling through Scripture at rabbidaniellappin.com. Do yourself a favor and don't start worrying about am I faith, no faith, do I believe in God, is there a... Don't worry about all of that. Just take a look at the book that starts it all. And take a look at the first 31 verses of that book. I promise you, you will be pleased you did. I furthermore promise you that it will completely astonish you and help you in changing whatever bad spiritual schematics you find yourself afflicted with. So go for it, rabbidaniellappin.com, and you take a look at uh, the uh, merchandise store. You also take a look at online courses scrolling through scripture and we'll do that together and uh, you'll see much of what i talk about is rooted in a spiritual schematic sculpted by those verses anyway you'll love it and uh, it'll do a lot for you because much more than i am shaped by my biology i am shaped by the ideas that have been imprinted in my soul my spiritual schematic Yes, it is changeable. Yes, it needs help, and this is where the help is found. So uh, go for that, dear happy warriors, and until next week when we enjoy the privilege of being together once again, I, your rabbi, wish you a splendid week of growth with your vitally important five Fs, your faith, your finances, your family, your fitness, and your friendships. Until next week, I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.